Okay, I'm Oliver Linton, Professor in the Faculty of Economics at the University of Cambridge, and I'm here to interview Maureen O'Hara, who is the Professor, uh, the, the uh, Robert W. Purcell Professor of Finance and Professor of Economics at Cornell University. She's a former president of the American Finance Association, and she's a very influential writer and talker about market microstructure. So let me start with my first question, which is, what is microstructure and why is it important? Well, um, so Oliver, I think a, a short answer to that is microstructure is the study of the structure and design of trading systems. So when you think about how we design stock markets or how um, trading platforms are designed, um, how they're designed influences uh, the outcome, the prices that emerge, and the liquidity that comes. So in general, we think about exchanges, for example, as providing liquidity and price discovery. Microstructure is the study of how the rules of trading influence the production of liquidity and price discovery. Okay, and how does that uh, matter for the wider economy and uh, you know, the ordinary Joe? Right. Well, there's kind of several, for the ordinary Joe, how well the market's designed determines the transactions costs they're going to face. So when you and I trade, um, we would much prefer to be in markets where transactions costs are low. And in general, we'd like to be in markets where prices are efficient. Because in finance, the notion is markets are efficient if they reflect all publicly available information. And as you well know, the, uh, when market prices are not efficient, you can devise trading rules based on just observing patterns of prices and make money. And, and you make money you know, by profiting at someone else's expense. And that, that's not what we'd like in, in an efficient market. So from the average per person's perspective, um, designing markets that work well, that, that provide liquidity and price discovery, results in lowest trading costs. And it makes uh, trading much more efficient and inexpensive. For the real economy, these issues become, I think, even more interesting because oftentimes in economics, I think there's been a view that the design of these markets is irrelevant because um, they don't really affect the real economy. But I think that's wrong because we know, for example, that markets allow for risk sharing and the ability for traders to be able to effectively offload risk um, is greatly enhanced when markets are efficient. So when we design markets that work well, we allow for um, prices of securities to reflect true values. And that, to the extent that investors feel that the prices are accurate reflections of underlying assets, then they're willing to hold them. And to the extent that individuals are willing to hold them, companies can use equity markets as a source of new capital and therefore they can invest. So I think there's a variety of reasons why, from both a financial perspective and a real perspective, we care about how well markets work. So they're not a, a zero-sum game, so there's definitely a... You know, there, there's certainly some contracts are zero-sum game in the sense that if you and I are in a futures contract, whether it goes up or down or not, um, you may win, you know, or I may win. But um, Equities, per se, are not really a zero-sum game in the sense that companies issue these and investors hold them. Um, and in terms of trading, um, trading is not, it, it is in some sense, the trading process can be a, um, a complex game in the sense that intermediaries step in the middle and they may be willing to buy and sell for different prices. And, you know, to the extent that you pay an intermediary, that's money that you're not keeping. But on the other hand, intermediaries provide a valuable service, right? In economics, we just assume that supply curves and demand curves cross. But in real markets, um, suppliers may all show up at one point, and demanders may all show up at another point, and nothing mm -hmm. may cross. And so an intermediary kind of brings those together. And for that, the doing that, the intermediary gets paid. So. I wouldn't call that actually a zero-sum game because there's actually a, a valuable service here. So what would be, so some people argue that the size of financial markets as a ratio of GNP, of national income, right. is uh, too high as it's grown a lot. Um, what is the right size and how would you explain that growth 
I think that's a really interesting set of issues, and it, um, when I hear those complaints, I'm reminded of that great scene in Amadeus where um, uh, Mozart is informed that, you know, the, the, the Mozart sonata or symphony, whichever it is they're talking about, simply has too many notes. And uh, Mozart replies, how can it have too many notes? It has just the notes, you know, just as many notes as it needs. I, I'm not very sympathetic to the idea that finance is too large because I think that we have contracts develop because people have needs. Um, so, for example, think about credit default swaps. Um, you might say, well, why do we need those? But you know, the reality is that if you were holding bonds, there was no good way to hedge the risk of default on bonds. And when bonds became mispriced, very difficult to short bonds. So, you know, bond markets there, therefore were riskier than they needed to be. You, you couldn't hedge the default risk easily, and you couldn't, you couldn't short an overvalued bond. Once you introduced credit default swaps, you could synthetically create bonds. And so now all of a sudden, a lot of the problems with bonds just w were, you know, ameliorated. They, they certainly weren't completely removed, but now if I wanted to hedge the risk, I could take a, you know, I could buy insurance with a CDS. And so, to me, the development of markets like that are hardly extraneous. They, they add to the ability to better tailor your risk preferences that people want to, to have. So I, I, I suspect there may be things that are uh, wasteful, but to be honest, I'm not real sure what they are. I think financial markets generally survive when they provide value, and when they don't provide value, they don't. Um, futures markets routinely introduce futures contracts every year that fail. Because the reality is, they're not meeting needs that anybody particularly needs. There's no volume in them. Exchanges can't make any money trading them. They go away. So, so only a small part is too big to fail. Is that the of of the financial markets, the financial tiny. system? I mean, generally, when we think about too big to fail, we're talking about the giant banks. Um, but you know, financial markets are huge, and a lot of them do not involve the banks. And we're talking about stock markets and bond markets and, and swap markets and those sorts of things. Um, the too big to fail there is, is, is not really well defined, right? I mean, mm. I, I'm not quite sure what it means. When people don't want to hold stocks, their prices go down. That's just what should happen, um, you know, so. Right. Uh, so you've written quite a bit about liquidity, so I, I wanted to, to, to move on to a question about specifically about liquidity with a, with a Cambridge connection. So I'm going to give you a quote from John Maynard Keynes, uh, a part of a quote, which is, of the maximum maxims of orthodox finance, none surely is more antisocial than the fetish of liquidity. And he goes on to say that there's no such thing as liquidity for the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So my question is really, was he talking about a different type of liquidity uh, that is relevant for today's markets, for microstructure? Uh, and what is your view about that, that quote and how it applies to your work? And it's fun to go back and read you know, Keynes and some of the earlier writers because they view the liquidity of the asset as, as almost a deadweight loss. Right? This is, you know, if you have to have, if the asset has to be liquid, then it can't be tied up in a long-term productive investment. And uh, it's interesting to me how over the course of time our view on liquidity has changed, right? You go back even before Keynes, which I know here in Cambridge you don't believe existed, but go back to Adam Smith and, and uh, you'll find in Adam Smith the articulation of the real bills doctrine that, you know, banks should never lend on anything other than real bills, on anything other than self-liquidating loans. and. Uh, when, when you look back on that now, we don't think the real bills doctrine was correct. Um, but it actually set the framework for the U.S. capital markets. Our banks, which were founded not long after our first ones, long after Adam Smith wrote, really were intended to make only short-term self-liquidating loans. They, they made you know, loans to farmers and things like that. And we developed in the U.S. long-term bond market because bonds were where illiquid investments were financed and 
you know, liquid investments were financed by banks. Um, now, Europe didn't quite get so carried away, and so you didn't have those distinctions. But um, that notion that, that some things were well suited for longer term illiquid ventures and, and some things for shorter was, you know, well, I think, well established for a long time. And then it blended, right? Now, you know, part of the challenge with our banks all being too big to fail is that virtually all their liabilities are redeemable on demand. And that, that does create some of the challenges that, that Keynes referred to, right? You can't expect a bank to make long-term loans if they have to turn around and be able to cash them in at any moment. So it, it does create challenges. In the markets that I look at, these, the securities markets, um, we tend to think about liquidity as the ability to you know, transact without unduly affecting the price. And um, you know, if, if an asset's really illiquid, you know, you can't sell your house overnight, right? You can't... Um, unless you live in Chelsea. <laughs> unless you live in parts of London. Yes, an excellent point. Uh, you know, we once were trying to sell a pony, the ultimate illiquid asset. Um, and uh, certainly some assets really don't have great liquidity. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things Keynes was pointing out is that liquidity can be very valuable to some people, but the notion that everything should be liquid is just mm -hmm. not right. It's just not right. And so with that, I completely agree with Keynes. Right. So then does that mean that as a, a measure of market quality, if we think about measuring the performance of stock markets and bond markets, that liquidity per se is not the, the only thing or the best thing? To, uh, to measure that? So, you know, markets, generally we think of measuring market quality by liquidity and price discovery, right? Bonds and, and, and stocks, by definition, I think are, are the liquid part of the assets, right? I mean, if you want to buy a, a winery or, uh, you know, you want to buy a, a particular piece of art, those characteristics. They, they don't trade in exchanges. They're, they're not well suited to trading in a venue designed for li liquid assets, right? But stocks and bonds tend to have features that do lend to more liquid markets. So I think for the types of markets, for, for stock markets, I think the ability to, to create liquidity is a good metric for a stock market. Right. Okay, well, let me, let me move on to, to my next question. So I think we should um, uh, talk more about uh, high-frequency trading. Uh, okay. It's been in the news recently with the contribution of Michael Lewis, who's dissected it and given us the point of view that markets are broken and rigs, rigged. Uh, so what is your view of this? Well, I don't think markets are rigged, and I, I think that that just reflects incomplete information on Michael Lewis's part. Um, I think markets always need to be uh, adjusting, right? Markets change and regulatory structures lag. And that I think in the current environment, the advent of high frequency trading revealed that the market structure we had was not well suited to the regulatory structure we had. But that, that happens. And, uh, when it happens, you need to rethink the rules and you need to think about how you want to regulate markets. So in the sense that Michael Lewis is arguing that perhaps some features of our regulatory structure are not right, I'm with him 100%. Um, but I think that he, um, I think he dramatically misses uh, the fact that, you know, broken in the sense of what? Uh, if you look at transactions costs, if you look at you know, liquidity, if you look at price discovery, by every metric we look at in, um, in academic economics and microstructure, markets are better now than they've ever been. So uh, it's just wrong to say they're rigged. And, and it's particularly frustrating because the markets that retail investors face have never been better. The transactions cost to be a retail guy are lower than they've ever been. The high frequency traders make a fraction of what the old NASDAQ dealers in the U.S. and the, 
NYC specialist or the similar market makers here in London used to mm. make. So the the way the markets work are much more efficient. There's far less transactions costs. What markets do now that I think is not so great is that they have periodic instability, an issue that Michael Lewis didn't even bring up. Um, he's busy mm. worrying about latency arbitrage, which I admit is a bit of a challenge, and, and it's a challenge not for individuals, it's a challenge for large institutions, but large institutions have adapted. They trade very differently now, recognizing that HF traders are out there, and again, I think the issues that Michael Lewis was referring to um, are nowhere near as important now as they were a number of years ago. Right, and you've written quite extensively on these issues, and I, I wanted to ask you specifically about what do you think is the role of academic research in addressing this, this debate? Well, I think, you know, it's a, it's a great time to be a researcher looking at these issues, and it's, it's, it's interesting because I find that um, both practitioners and regulators really value and welcome the research that academics are doing. I mean, part of the challenge right now, take high frequency, it's very political, right? It sounds bad, right? That, you know, when you start talking about things in milliseconds and microseconds and, and you know, somebody can trade in 15, you know, microseconds and it takes you, you know, 400 milliseconds to blink your eye, you, you can't fathom what's going on here. And, and so there's an awful lot of uh, popular press that just paints this as evil. And um, I think the on the other side, you know, you have the high frequency traders who naturally are going to defend what they do, but um, not all high frequency traders behave in ways that are optimal for these markets. And that ability to trade so quickly and to use technology not only to bring markets better and closer together, but to exploit others is there. And so mm -hmm. the High frequency guys have incentive issues as well that I think undermine their credibility in terms of, of saying, trust us, we're doing everything right. And the regulators are, I think, uh, for the most part, trying to um, do the right thing. And, and I think our SEC, for the most part, has done the right thing. But it's, it's stunningly complex. So mm. having trained researchers who don't have a stake in the game come in and be able to evaluate this is, to me, exactly what we should be doing. And, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's, I think, extremely gratifying for those of us working in these areas to realize the impact we have, right? The, um, you know, the, you know, I write papers and, and I know that, um, uh, you know, practitioners are reading them trying to figure out, gee, what can I do? You know, could I take her advice and do X or Y? Or, you know, with co-authors, we've been designing new sorts of algorithms that will allow traders to minimize transactions costs. And we've been providing new tools for regulators to think about how to monitor markets. And we've been developing new tools for our other researchers. So, great time to be a microstructure researcher, as mm. I know you know, since you do right. this work as well. So there is a famous quote, of course, uh, please bring me a one-armed economist. <laughs> or, uh, so are we ever going to get to a, a consensus on, on issues around market microstructure and uh, high-frequency trading? You know what's really interesting is that um, I've often thought that finance people tend to be more one-armed than, than their economics counterparts. Right? Um, I think if you think about financial economists, and uh, I think looking at the stock market is really a good way to illustrate this. When we talk about market quality, we generally talk about liquidity and price discovery. And we have metrics about liquidity and price discovery. When economists talk about market quality, they often want to bring in concepts like social welfare. And um, social welfare really does get you into the two-handed you know, problem, right? Because, well, these people are made better off and these people are worse off. and, and you know, whereas uh, finance often looks at the issue and says, I'm not sure who's better or worse off because I can't, I can't weight everybody. I'm going to look at minimizing transactions costs and, and enhancing efficiency. So 
the academic finance literature is, is surprisingly um, on board with a number of uh, conclusions with respect to HF. You know, so it's not so bad. Uh, another issue I wanted to, to touch on is transparency. So a common perception is that uh, transparency is generally good uh, for both polit political and economic outcomes. So um, what is your view on the limits of transparency in financial markets? In reality, in financial markets, everybody wants everyone else's trades to be transparent. And uh, I think that um, it, it is a very difficult issue. In, in the U.S., back in the legislation that set up our national market system back in the 70s, the, that you know, act of Congress basically set out a series of goals that we wanted for U.S. markets, and one of those is transparency. And that has been a very, very challenging thing to implement because for, if you want to trade 100 shares of stock as a retail trader, transparency is fine for you. If you want to trade 50,000 shares of stock, transparency is a nightmare because other people will try and free ride on your trades and they will try and, and front run you. And, and it goes back to the notion that liquidity is well defined for one little trade mm -hmm. and not well defined once you get to large amounts. It's, it's not like um, a product that's manufactured and can be put on the shelf and when you need more of it, you grab it. You have to, liquidity cr is created and the process of creating liquidity is not always enhanced by transparency. So now we have a world in which you could argue that we've gone too far the other way, that you know, we often hear a lot about dark trading and lit trading, but you know, even looking on the lit markets, that is the you know, London Stock Exchange and the Deutsche and Boris and the other big European markets, they all allow hidden orders in those exchanges. And you say, well, why would someone want to hide their order? Well, if you're trying to take a very large position say 25,000 shares and you're going to try and trade it over time, you would rather not have people see that you put 25,000 sh shares on the book. I you're just going to induce you know, non-competitive behavior. So um, when you say you're not in favor of transparency, you sound a bit like you're not in favor of motherhood and, and, and those sorts of things. But um, Transparency is, um, is not ideal for some settings, and particularly trading. Right, so it does come back down to this balance between different interests, I guess. Right. So, there isn't, so in some sense, one does need a, a social welfare function to dis, you know, decide where to come down, where the line should be drawn. I think the, you know, the interesting question is, you often hear people say, you know, markets aren't fair, right? Mm. And, I think what's very interesting is that, um, at least for U.S. markets, we never said they were going to be fair. And the reason they're not fair is that individual traders are not the same, right? What's fair for someone who wants to trade 100 shares of stock as a retail trader, the optimal market for that person, is not the optimal market for someone who has 100,000 shares and has to sell them today. So, w because traders don't start at the same position, the outcomes of these markets are not going to be the same, right? So, to begin with, you, you know, having a market that equally meets the needs of everyone doesn't really work. And that's really what we've seen in the evolution of recent markets, that before it was, you know, one size fits all. We got one market, everybody mm -hmm. trades in it, and the reality is that you know, that market wasn't particularly good for retail traders, and it wasn't particularly good for institutional traders, and it's probably better for the people who are actually were make, running the exchanges. In, in current markets now, one of the things that's happened is we've had specialized markets develop or specialized trading methods for retail and different markets for institutions who want to have this kind of market. And, other markets for institutions want that. And, you know, then the issue is can you tie all these markets together in a way that makes sense? And 
So it's a very different design from the one size fits all mm -hmm. to we're going to have markets, a market of markets, which is really what we have now. And once you have a market of markets, then the issues of fairness almost come down to fair access to the markets, right? Can you, can you, fair, can you freely get to the market that best meets your neat trading mm -hmm. needs? And that's a very different perspective, but I think it's the way markets work now. Right, and you've talked a lot about the, 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 the new developments in markets and how things are faster, there's more choices and right. more complexity. Are regulators catching up with this complexity and you know, where is it going to go uh, in the future? I think the regulators have, have been um, greatly uh, impeded by the fact that technology you know, kind of surpassed them, right? You, you can't, um, you, you, you cannot uh, regulate a market that's moving in milliseconds when you're watching it every hour. It, it just doesn't work that way. And it's not from lack of effort, it's just that you, you can't, you know, markets today have to have surveillance that's also being done by machines. And the technology spend to do that has been non-trivial. Um, you know, in the U.S. now, the SEC contracted with TradeWorks, one of the larger high-frequency firms, to take their trading tools and use those to surveil U.S. markets. And I think that's the reality of, of the way things are going to work. It's just great. You know, you, you wouldn't expect to launch a, you know, a, a rocket to the moon a, a using hand calculators, right? I mean, everyone would laugh at you, right? Well. Why do you think you can regulate a market that's operating at microseconds with individuals reading daily trip sheets? It, it's, you know, it, and it, it's not a criticism of the regulators. It's just that there's a natural inertia of ability to fund regulatory agencies and to have people who have the specialized skills that you need. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of the regulators. I think they've been doing a very good job, but um, you know they need more resources and they need to change the focus. And I think you know certainly the regulators here in Britain and the regulators in the U.S. are well aware of that. Right. So they're they're uh, playing catch up, but they're they're doing a better job at it now than they than they, were. they did five years ago. The regulators are always playing catch up. I mean, mm. because the markets innovate, and then the regulators catch up. And the challenge now is that markets are innovating faster. So. You know, you, you tend to have these lags, right? But, you know, the rest of the market also catches up. Remember, it isn't that, you know, were it for the regulators, we would all be taken advantage of. Because, in fact, markets are smart. If they think that these markets are not fair or these markets are not working well, they won't. They, the traders won't come. And, um, and so I think what we've seen in the markets is that the markets have developed a lot of their own mechanisms that keep some of these undesirable factors in check.